morning. Pastor Bob Shetler of First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville here to say thank you for joining us this morning. At First Presbyterian, our purpose is to glorify God, make disciples of Jesus Christ, and meet human needs. I'm very pleased that you have chosen to take time from your busy schedule to worship the living Lord Jesus with us this morning. Good morning. It's good to see you on this Lord's Day. And this is uh, two things I wanted to remind you of this morning. One is it's ordination and installation of our new uh, elders and deacons. And then secondly, it is uh, dedication day and asking for you to turn in your pledge card for next year if you would do so. And if you do that, then that saves our committee some work of making phone calls. There are some cards in the pews. We ask for you to continue to be faithful to the stewardship of uh, God's ministry in this congregation. So with these things in mind, let us uh, prepare our hearts for worship. Let us stand for our call to worship and remain standing for our opening hymn, number 150. In the midst of war and division, we wait for God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. In the midst of devastation and loss, we wait for God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. In the midst of change and uncertainty, we wait for God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God.
We turn to God in praise and prayer, not from a position of power and strength, but from the broken edges of our lives. From We offer our prayers of confession, trusting in the one who is reconciling all things. Let us pray together. Merciful God, you have called us to live in sincere faith and to suffer for the gospel. We confess that we do not come before you with clear conscience. Our faith is clouded by sin and uncertainty. We shrink from your call to live sacrificially on behalf of others. Too quickly we seek your own peace and comfort first. We confess that our own lives and in the church we rely on the power rather than yours. Forgive us, we pray, for we are fractured and fearful disciples. Take away from us a spirit of cowardice and restore to us a spirit of power. And of self discipline gracefully lived. In new mercy, forgive us and increase our faith that we may be faithful servants at your table. Now, O oh Lord, transform us as we continue our confession in silence. God, in Christ Jesus, grants us grace, mercy, and peace. Let us hold to the sound teaching of the faith that God has the power to save us and has given us grace through the ages. We receive the treasure of faith entrusted to us with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. pray. Holy God, through Christ Jesus, you bring the light of the gospel into our lives as grace revealed. Help us to guard this treasure and to share it with others so that the faith that has lived in our ancestors and now lives in us may come to life in every new generation. This we pray with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's New First Testament, first New Testament reading is from 1 Ch Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Peter reminds us that leaders are shepherds, and sheep must be led, not driven. Our service must be willing and humble. We must be eager to help others with love and kindness. Please hear the word of the Lord. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you 
not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not for dom not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood through the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, if to the will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
All the children are invited to join us for a time for young disciples, led by Lisa Lundy. Afterward, children will return to sit with their families. Good morning. Who among you can raise your hand and tell me how many days of school you have left? <gasps> you know the answer to this question? Okay, Nora, how many? Nine? Are you excited for summer? Well, I was thinking about the end of school and how your teachers might be ready for summer too. Think, maybe? Did you guys just have teacher appreciation recently? No, I know some of you did. You probably had time when you could write your teacher's thank you notes and tell them all the nice things they've done for you this year. If you haven't done that, this is a good time to do it this week. They might need a thank you this week. But you know, at our schools, our teachers are some leaders there, right? They lead us through our days, and we see what happens with them in the classroom. But I know some of you know this because you have mamas and daddies that are teachers. For every minute they spend with you in the classroom, they spend a lot of minutes before that and after that getting ready for you, getting projects ready and grading your papers and just thinking about you and worrying about you because they love you. And today, we're going to be installing elders and deacons for our church, and they are leaders in our church. You can kind of think about them like your teachers at school, that they're leaders here at church. And for everything you see them do, maybe up here or in some activities that you go to, there's a lot of things that you never see them do. Praying for you and thinking about you and planning and trying to figure out what God wants for our church. So I was thinking about what we could do, what's our part, because they have a lot of things they do. Our part I was listening to this last song that the choir sang for us. It says, grant us wisdom and grant us courage. And if you ever think, I would like to do something for the elders and deacons, but I don't know what, you can pray those two things for them. Grant us wisdom and grant us courage. Okay? Will you pray with me? The congregation, will you join us? Lord Jesus, thank you for this day when we can um, welcome new leaders for our church that we rely on and that you have called and that you use so greatly in this church um, to do your will and do your work. And we pray that you would grant them wisdom and grant them courage each day. In your name we pray, amen. Just in case you're confused, we're going to sing the next hymn at the end of the sermon. For those of you who are trying to figure out where we are, a little change in the order of worship today. Today we come to install our um, elders and deacons for these next three years. And what I would like to say to you is the message today is from Paul to Timothy about his own ordination, but the message is to all of us as followers of Jesus Christ, because all of us in some form or fashion in the world we live in today, we are spiritual leaders, because God has called us to be that. So would you please hear the word of the Lord from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. 
For this reason, I am reminded to fan in the flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That, why, that is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him unto, until that day. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. There is a scene in the Civil War motion picture, God in Generals, that is telling. The movie follows follows the rise and the fall of the Civil War hero, General Thomas Jackson, and does not try to hide his Christianity. Throughout the picture, Jackson's dependence on God is shown, but never more strikingly than that early morning of July 21st, 1861, prior to the first battle of Bull Run. As the glimmers of dawn break forth, Jackson calls out to God, asking for his will to be done. Almost immediately, things don't go well. For their outnumbered Confederates, the Union forces quickly overpowered them. The Confederate line broke. All-out retreat ensued, and several Confederate groups ran to the next line of defense that was held by Jackson and his men. Morale was all but gone as retreating soldiers swarmed Jackson's position with the Union Army on their heels, but then someone yelled out in the dim battle of the men, telling them, look at Jackson. At that moment, General Jackson was sitting erect in his saddle with a cannon fire exploding all around him. His left hand had already been wounded by a musket bullet. Nevertheless, he did not flinch. Word spread among the men. Look at Jackson, standing like a stone wall, they said. Stonewall Jackson, as he would be known from that day forward, paced his horse back and forth across the hazardous front line, charging his men as the musket bullets pierced through the air. His stunning bravery stirred the men to valor, and they turned to face the advancing Union forces with new resolve. At the end of the day, Jackson turned to the battlefield to survey the losses. 111 men dead, 373 missing. Weary and sad Jackson knelt beside a dead soldier, and it was then when one of his captains asked him, General, how is it that you can keep so serene and stay so utterly insensible with a storm of shells and bullets around your head. Jackson replied, Captain Smith, my religious beliefs teach me to feel as safe in bed as in battle. God has fixed a time for my death. I do not concern myself with that, but to always be ready whenever it may be, whenever it may overtake me. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? If all of us were just as prepared for battle the spiritual battles that we face. Stonewall Jackson was declaring his belief that God ruled over the details of his life, even the flight of bullets. 
His bravery was based on his belief. God is God in fact as well as in name that he is on the throne of the universe directing things and working all things according to the counsel of his own will. We are all spiritual people, followers of Jesus Christ. We are all spiritual leaders, followers of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be, if it hasn't already, it will come in your life that you will have to take a stand for what you believe. You will have to take a stand for your faith in Jesus Christ. The question is, how will you stand? And the question is, will you not be ashamed? And the question is, how will you prepare yourself for this battle? Today we talk about spiritual leadership, and I want you to know that it comes from Paul, and I'm always reminded what Paul wrote. Paul wrote that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. So as we come to this, we come to ordain and install new leaders, I want to encourage all of us to think about these things. The setting of our scripture today is that Paul is in prison. Paul has been in prison because of his stand for Jesus Christ. He's in the latter days of his life, and he decides to write these letters to Timothy, his young man that he is discipling and mentoring, to empower him in his ministry and reminding him of several fundamental needs of spiritual leaders in the church of Jesus Christ. First is the encouragement for us to fan the flame of the gift of God within us. Our spiritual life must always be cared for. Just like a fire, the gift of God has to be cared for. If we don't, the flame will go out, but we need to keep our faith alive. We need to keep our belief in Christ alive. It's so easy for us to tend to everything else in our lives, isn't it? They seem to be more pressing sometimes in the spiritual things. Paul says here there's a gift that God has given us. There's several interpretations we could take of that. Paul is referring here to perhaps the, um, the gifts of salvation in faith that lives in Timothy. Perhaps he's referring to his ordination when Paul laid hands on him. And perhaps he's referring to the, the anointing of God's Holy Spirit on Paul's life at that time. Don't misunderstand me. I believe that when you receive Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit comes into your life at that time. But I also believe there are other times in the life of a Christian where there's a different anointing, a different coming of the Spirit in a different way. The reference here also could mean that he's trying to remind him of the gifts that he's received through the Holy Spirit to do ministry. Uh, we tend to the flame that God has put within us to keep the gifts alive, to keep our faith burning, to keep our spiritual life warm. You remember the old blacksmith that they would, you'd see him in the movies and they would have the fire and they'd take those bellows and they'd pump it like that? That was a burst of air that would help to kindle the fire. And I hope that you can hear that today, is that we all need that burst within our spiritual lives. All of us need to keep our faith alive, to keep it burning, especially spiritual leaders. And all of us as followers of Jesus Christ, as I said earlier, at some point and sometime each day, someone's watching your spiritual life, your spiritual growth. What Paul's also saying here is, when you kindle this fire, we don't need anything else. All the ingredients for that is already there. We just need to tend to it. We just need to fan the flame that's already there. Paul said this earlier to Timothy. He said, do not neglect the gift within you. And what I want to say to each of us is God has given us gifts to do the ministry. I'm also a firm believer that God gives us, gives us different ways for different times of our ministry. So in order to live a strong spiritual life, we must fan the flame within us to be spiritual leaders. Here's another thought. We fan the flame of the Holy Spirit within us to release the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we quench it. Sin will quench it. I believe our attitude will quench it. I believe other people can quench it for us. But we must fan that flame. So let me illustrate it, just a brief illustration. 
On the first Saturday of each May, there's a very special sporting event called the Kentucky Derby. You may have heard of it. This is a horse race about three-year-old thoroughbreds. The race is about horses. Let me tell you what, when you stand beside one of them, they are powerful, they are beautiful, and hopefully they're fast. That's the key thing. But the horses are trained and ready to do one thing, run. They are built for speed, but all that power is held back at the beginning by one thing, the starting gate. You can see them load those horses in there, and some of them aren't real happy about that confinement. Neither would I be, to be honest with you. But until the gate is open, until they are released, the power and the purpose and the potential of what they have been trained to do as world-class horses is not released. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit within us. Until we allow ourselves to let that Holy Spirit to be released in our lives, then we're not fanning that flame to be what God has called us to be. The power of the Holy Spirit is not released for the ongoing process of our spiritual growth. We are all gifted with the Holy Spirit, and we are all gifted with gifts from the Holy Spirit, and we all need to continue to rekindle and fan the flame of those gifts so the work of the Holy Spirit in Christ can be done through us because everyone has been bestowed with these gifts and everyone has been divinely equipped for the ministry. Now, let's look at another side of this. There are four ways that we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit through the gifts of God. One is negative and the other three are positive. I want to turn the negative one into a positive one, though. Here they are. The negative one is, is that we are not to be timid. In fact, any spirit that reflects a timid approach to our gifts of ministry are not from God. Timid means we're fearful, we're cowardice, we're shameful. Our movement is generated by fear. But what Paul is saying to us, we need to be bold in what God has given us. Now, let's look at the other three. Let's go back to the fire again for just a moment. Some of you remember Smokey the Bear? Remember that, that teaching, you know, that you'd always see those little commercials? Well, he had this little idea that the triangle of fire, three things, heat, fuel, and oxygen. And when all three of those are put in the right presence, in the right conditions, the right mixture, what happens? We have fire. Paul is saying here there are three things that we need to have to have the Spirit burning within us in our spiritual lives. First of all, there's power. And second, there's love. And third, there's self-discipline. Power is a great force and energy. And when Paul was saying you need to release this Spirit within you, we're reminded of what Jesus said to his disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Vine defines this as saying the ability requisite for meeting difficulties and the fulfillment of the service committed to us, the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. Second is the spirit of love. The spirit of love is so clearly defined by Ray Steadman when he says, we are expected not only to be concerned about our struggles and problems, but others too. And we long to reach out to them and to help them with their problems. That's really in the role of the deacon in many ways in our constitution, in our structure of officers. There is nothing more proof and more powerful to me than a person through the Spirit of God who shows evidence and concern for someone else's problems. That's the spirit of love. It's in the constant action of giving ourselves away for the benefit of others. This is our ministry of love that we've been called to do to fan the flame within us. The third one is discipline. Most of us don't like that word. It really translates, deeper thought, is sound mind, soundness, moderation, and self-control. Therefore, Paul wrote, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my servant so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Those are the three ingredients. The idea of power and of love and self-discipline brings us to the fact that this flame will be tended to and cared for and burn brightly in the ministry God's called us to. Then he invites us to two things, two invitations. 
First of all, the invitation is not to be ashamed of the Lord. This letter was written about A.D. 66, and let me tell you, at that time, there was a lot of persecution of the church. The Christians were being criticized and persecuted, imprisoned, and even sent to death. One's association with Jesus or with Paul or the gospel at that time brought animosity and rejection. We are not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are three things where I think people are ashamed of what's going on in our world today as far as Christians. One is, we are not to be ashamed of the name of Jesus, who we are called to witness for. Two is, we are not to be ashamed of the church of Jesus Christ because we're a part of that church. And three is, we are not to be ashamed of the gospel which has been entrusted to us to share. Now, the next invitation is one that's kind of interesting. He invites us to suffering. He invites us to join him in his suffering. Now, remember, when we think we're suffering for Jesus, just think about Paul. He's in his old ages, he's in prison, and believe me, the prisons over there are not very attractive. They were dungeons, and they were dark, and they were under very high scrutiny. And so he says, come, suffer with me. And then he wrote in another chapter in Philippians, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Paul says, come and join me, because when you fan this flame, you'll be prepared just like the illustration I used with Jackson, to stand in the middle of the battle, convinced and confirmed of what God has called you to do. So what is this gospel that we're supposed to be standing for and not ashamed of? If you look at verses 9, 10, and 11, you will find a mini course in soteriology. And if you want to know what that word means, it's the doctrine of salvation. And so what we find here is the foundation of our faith. It's the power of God who calls us that will sustain us. The one who is faithful will call you, and he will do it. The God who saves us has the power to keep us as his. Here's the calling. The calling is to salvation, and the calling is to a holy life. The purpose of salvation is for each of us as followers of Jesus Christ to be obedient to his holiness instead of to ourselves. That's a difficult task sometimes as a leader. The basis of salvation and holy living is because of the grace of God. I love what he writes in here. He says, not of anything I did. And let me tell you what, you start thinking that, man, I'm here in my spiritual life and I'm being ordained or I'm at this position in my life because of what I've done, wrong. Salvation is a gift from God and I believe the call to leadership is the same gift. The driving plan of God's grace is simply incredible. It's a child of God who has chosen us and gifted us and say, I want you to be the ones who take the gospel to the world at this day and time. God chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and that we should be blameless before him. Do you hear this? God has chosen you, some of you more than once. What do I mean by that? chosen you for salvation, and now chosen you for leadership in a particular role. Here's the difficulty with that. You've heard me say it before, and I'll continue to say it over and over. It's one thing to say that we are chosen people of God, which Presbyterians like to boast about. But it's another thing to embrace that chosenness. And that chosenness cannot just be embraced by sitting in the pew on Sunday morning. It must be embraced because we take on these things I'm talking about. Not just the elders and the deacons or the pastor. All of us as the followers of Jesus Christ have been chosen. We have been gifted. We have been given. And when we don't exercise those things, then part of the body of the Christ is sick and lame. Because it takes all of us to do what God has called us to do. And so we have to accept his chosenness, not just talk about it. Why should we accept his chosenness? Because since the foundation of the world... He has had us on his mind and his heart. And if you really believe in the sovereignty of God, you believe that sometime in the past, in the foundation of the world, God knew this day was going to happen. And that he would call these people to be the leaders of this congregation. So it's because of that that we want to understand his chosenness. Because of us, he has sent his son to give us the full revelation of God. 
Aren't we more blessed than the Old Testament people? We've had this story about the Son of God who represents God himself. Because of Jesus Christ, he's destroyed the power over sin and death through his resurrection. And that's part of the power he's given to us. This is the gospel we are to fan the flame to burn within us. This is the gospel that we are to live with boldness and power and love and self-discipline. This is the gospel that we are not to be ashamed of. This is the gospel that reminds us of the greatest gift of any gift in the world, the gift of salvation. This is the gospel that calls us to be messengers of grace to the world that needs grace. This is the gospel that calls us to be messengers of salvation to a world that needs salvation. This is why we can suffer for the gospel and why we have no cause for its shame. And then there's verse 12. I want to call this a creed. I believe there's permanence in these words from Paul. Twice we find, I have believed. In the Greek, it's put in this text, this tense, to emphasize that it's an ongoing process. Permanently, he has put his trust and his confidence in Christ. He trusted in Christ in salvation. He trusted in Christ in persecution. He trusted in Christ in all things now in the past. Just as Jackson said, and I love that, that line, I, I'm just as comfortable in battle as I am in bed. That's a scary thought, isn't it? But that's a deep trust in God. That's the Christ that we're called to follow. This is the hope and security of our call not only to salvation but to service. Listen to the words, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. That's what I want us to sing together. If you would take the insert to your worship, God, and I'd love for you to join me as you stand and we sing these words from Paul.
I just want you to know that's our first affirmation of faith today. We'll have another one in just a few moments. We come to a time of ordination and installation. I'm going to call uh, forward those who are here to be uh, ordained and installed today as elders. Bob Bailey. You'd come. Todd Best. Deanna Cook. Missy Lentz. Pamela Patton. Scott Perry. Eleanor Samuels. We have a couple who are absent today. And then as deacons, if you would please, uh, Pam Bailey, Linda Donaldson, Perry Foote, and Dale Seifert. Now in case you, uh, Margaret Weech, I'm sorry, Margaret, I jumped over your name there. Margaret is elder. In case you don't remember, these are the ones that you've elected as a congregation. And that's why I constantly say, there is not only a call on their life for salvation, there's a call on their life for service at this time in the congregation. So I'm going to ask if you all would turn and face me at this time, in, uh, or face the choir so you can make faces at them uh, during this time. And if each of you would respond appropriately to these questions for me, please. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him, Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you accept the scriptures of Old and New Testament to be the Holy, by the Holy Spirit, the unique authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal in God's word to you? And do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as an expression in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable exposition of what Scripture leads us to believe and do, and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Y'all did good. Change that on you, huh? Will you be governed by our church's policy and will you abide by its discipline Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for reconciliation of the world? And do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? And will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? And to you as elders, if you'd respond, please. Will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? And to the deacons. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, directing people's help to the friendliness of those in need, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and the justice of Jesus Christ? Good. Now, if you turn and face the congregation for me, please. Congregation, if you'd respond appropriately, do you, the members of the church, accept Bob Bailey, Todd Best, Deanna Cook, Missy Lentz, Pamela Patton, Scott Perry, Eleanor Samuels, and Margaret Weech as ruling elders, and Pam Bailey, Linda Donaldson, Perry Foote, and Dale Seifert as deacons, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do you agree to pray for them, encourage them to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? Today, I want you to know that Todd Best, Todd, if y'all just wave your hand as I call your name, Deanna Cook, Missy Lentz, and Pam Patton, Linda Donaldson is being ordained as a deacon, the first four as elders. So at this time, I'd like for them to turn back and face me again, if you would, and I'd like for any other ordained elders and deacons of our congregation to come and join me, if you would, for the laying on of hands. If you are so inclined and able, you may kneel, but if you're not so inclined and able, don't. Someone, 
and you are welcome um, to come and join us. And so at this time, would you pray with me, please? Father God, we come to this time and we recognize that, that the real ordination is not from us or from any church, that the ordination upon these lives is from you. It is from you that is set forth in us in understanding the teachings of our heritage in the New Testament and also in the Old Testament where people were called forth to be leaders. People were called forth to be those who helped to guide the congregation. We know from, from Moses there was a time that he just couldn't do it all. And they, they selected those who would be his help. And then from that we move forward and we find the, the bringing forth of deacons to help lead to do the care of the congregation so the pastor and the teachers could be about the, the scriptures and the apostles' teachings. And then, Lord, you call forth elders. In fact, that's the basis of our name. Presbyterian is the basis of an elder system where we select, elect, confirm, and ordain leaders to be the representatives of the whole congregation for the leadership. And so, Lord, in this day, we place our hands upon these people who are being ordained and those who are being installed. We ask for your gifts to them. We ask for you to allow them to fan within them the flame of what God has given them and that they would lead us with love and with power and with boldness and with self-discipline. So, Lord, in these days, we pray that they would attend to their own spiritual growth as they help to lead us as the congregation in our spiritual growth together. So, Lord, use this team, use these to be the leaders you've called about and separated for this time in this service. Help us that work with them and help us who follow them to understand your desire and your call upon us for a specific task and season in the life of our lives and the life of a congregation. Bless us and anoint us with your power in these days. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but I take this very serious. Uh, I've been ordained twice. I don't know what that means, but I remember when I was ordained the first time, we knelt and every elder or deacon or leader came by and laid hands on us and said something to us. And, and I remember in that time, there was one verse a man said to me, and I haven't forgotten it. And it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. And it says, He who called you is faithful, and he will do it. And if I can ask you to hang on to anything else as a, as a new leader in this congregation or as one who's coming back for another time of service, never lose sight of the importance when God calls you and chooses you for salvation, and then he calls you and is affirmed by the church to a particular ministry and task that you will be faithful because he's promised to be faithful to you. Would you stand with us, please, as Fred comes and leads us in our second affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. If you will, join me as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to remind you, if you have prepared yourself, if you would take your pledge cards and place them in the offering plate. I turned mine in earlier today, and I'd like for you to know that this is a very important process of being good stewards of God's resources to us. If you're a guest with us today, we have the fellowship pads there. If you're a member, also if you would sign in, we would appreciate it. And before we go further, Kama, are you still here? Kama? She just gave Mark a look. I saw that, Kama. <laughs> Let me just say a word. Kama's been, how many years have you been with us uh, in the whole, the whole nine years, in, in the two tenures, right? And Kama, is Galaxy here today? Okay. Next Sunday is your last Sunday, right? And I'm not going to be here, so I wanted to verbally express to you our thanks for your giftedness and your music. Our prayers for you and Galaxy as you go to Jacksonville in a new chapter in your life, right? With a lot of things still uncertain, but this congregation is going to pray for you. I wanted to say a word publicly today, but next week, in my absence, who's preaching next week? Scott, okay? In my absence next week, I was wondering if he was thinking about it. Uh, we'll have a celebration for you, but I wanted to say thank you for your leadership and for your time here, and best to you in Galaxy, okay? And we consider this part of our stewardship as we help the trains came here as a student and then came on to be on our staff for nine years. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll miss you. Okay. It's, it's sort of like the coaches, you know, they get them for so many years and then they move on, right? And one student said, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm in my fifth year. You know what I called him? Academic red shirt. You know, we look at an athlete and say, oh, that's okay, they went five years. Students, it's okay too. Uh, so we're glad that we have a part in, in students' lives and move on to their profession and then the Lord calls them other places. So thank you, Kama, for your leadership. Let's worship God with, our God with our tithes and offerings this morning.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. Father, we come before you. We have so much to be thankful for. We're thankful for the salvation that lies within us. We're thankful for the sanctification that continues with every breath in which we take. We're thankful that one day we will stand in glory, fully made new, and in your presence only. Father, help us to take these gifts and to understand that there is spiritual warfare all around us, tugging at our hearts in every direction. But yet you call us to focus on you, to stand in the midst of the battle, and to proclaim your name. So Father, give us the strength. Give us the strength to shout it from the rooftops and to not be ashamed of your name, the only name that saves, Jesus Christ. So Father, help us to remember these things and to remember the words in which your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
invitation today is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and the invitation is to come to his church. Uh, Allison's going to be here, Allison Van Denen, and she is one of our elders to greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I invite you, if you don't have a church home in this community, to come and join us. And I invite you also, if you've not experienced the power of the resurrected Christ in your life as your Savior and Lord, I invite you to come to him. For the elders and deacons, if you would, if you all take time just to go in, those who have been ordained and all in the fellowship hall, and just kind of let us have a chance to greet you. And if you're a guest today, come and join us, and let us have a chance of meeting each other and getting to know one another and celebrating this wonderful day. May the living Lord Jesus go with you. May he go above you to watch over you, beside you to be your friend, behind you to give you protection, underneath you to give you stability within you to bring you peace, and before you to show you the way, both now and forevermore. Amen. Again, let me thank you for joining us in our worship today at First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville. I invite you to come on Sunday and join us personally at 1055 in our sanctuary at 106 Southwest 3rd Street in downtown Gainesville. We have other ways to be involved in the ministry offerings of First Presbyterian Church, children's ministry, music ministry, a ministry with college students. You can reach us at 352-378-1527 or on the web at 1stpc.org.